key, maybe, of the new superconductors? No, I should have an account already. Yeah. No, the billing's the same as the shipping address. How much do they weigh? Under what pressure? Well, <laughs> oh, hello, and welcome to Office Hours. The, I didn't even hang up. The live component, to, live component of the facility, it's a very important client, where good old Professor Kyle opens up his blast doors and he allows you, my professors and my staff, my research assistants and associates and interns to ask me any old question while you have my time and attention, which is about an hour. And we go through a number of topics as we do each week. This week is like those other weeks where we are going to be talking about this, that, this, that, this, and then this, that, this, that, this. But before we get to all that, if you want to become a member of the facility, if you want to put on a lab coat and talk to me almost every day and get special behind the scenes stuff, that's patreon.com slash Kyle Hill. And my lovely security team will be helping out all day in the chat. No spam, no all caps and emojis and stuff. I'm not in eighth grade. Okay. So be cool in the chat. And if you want to be really cool in the chat, you can also super chat. If you really, really want me to say, see something, to the best of my ability, I will try to see all the simps for science as I often try to do. For example, Fluffy Pay Doquette with the SEK50. The hello show love Kyle. <coughs> First time catching you live. Does the space station shape matter? If so, which one is the best? Keep up the great work. Well, see, this is a great example of a super chat because I'd say, well, it depends on what the space station is for. If it's ever going to enter the atmosphere again, probably not. It could be the shape of a board cube. It could be the shape of a Dyson ring. It could be whatever you want. Unless you want to generate something like artificial gravity in the space station, then some of it needs to be rotating at a certain RPM, a certain distance away from the rotational point. You see how easy that is? Now that's simping. Now let's hold on to the sims for just a second because I want to get to our first topic, of course, which is a holy grail superconductor. But as I said, there's a catch. So what you are witnessing now is a very well shot and well lit superconductor. So the superconductor is this base surface here and it is cooled to cryogenic temperatures. Now, cryogenic temperature is not a hard and fast rule. It's usually a temperature at which many gases will liquefy, like liquid, uh, like nitrogen or hydrogen, helium, that kind of thing. So cry cryogenic temperature is around negative 180 uh, degrees Celsius or so, negative 340. It's pretty close to absolute zero, not that many degrees away. So this superconductor is cooled like that, and that cooling will come into play later. Now, the two important aspects that you need to know, what am I, a listicle? About a superconductor is that it exhibits two properties. One is that it allows completely resistance-free electric transmission. So if you were to send some electrical current through this superconductor in this state, there'd be literally zero resistance. No energy, no power lost to heat. It is, it, is, it is perfect, theoretically perfect transmission. The other thing that a superconductor does is that it does not like magnetic fields. It kicks magnetic fields out like an e-girl with pop music when they're 18. I don't know if that made sense, but it was funny in my head, so I said it. So, a superconductor will act to expel magnetic fields from its interior. It doesn't like them. So what you're seeing here is a stack of neodymium magnets, and they are, this is above, they are levitating above a supercooled superconductor. And that's because if the magnets were to fall down, there would be a changing magnetic field, which would induce an electrical current, which would flow completely free in the superconductor, which creates its own magnetic fields in opposition to the changing magnetic field, and the end result is that everything floats. It's complicated, but don't worry, we'll go through all of it pretty soon. So what's the big hullaba news? Well, the big hullaba news is that for the last century, well, we've known about superconductivity for a long time, and it's allowed for a lot of amazing technologies. For example, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, MRIs, uh, maglev trains, things that can really, really take advantage of zero electrical resistance and high strength magnetic fields. The problem being 
is that this needs to constantly be cooled with cryogenic liquid. It needs to be at cryogenic temperature all the time, and that's not cheap, it's not easy to make. And so to have any large scale application of this almost magical quantum mechanical effect, and I use magical with the grandest of these, but if we, can, if we ever really wanted to take advantage of the supremely interesting properties of superconductors, we would need a way to cool them all the time, cheaply, reliably, safely. Right now, we can't mass market that kind of technology because the cooling is just too much. So for 100 years, we've been searching for the room temperature superconductor. That is a superconductor that at around, you know, 70 degrees Fahrenheit exhibits the same zero resistance expellation, that's not a word, expelling of magnetic fields from its interior that you see in this superconductor. Well, hark, nerds, we did it. A team, let me make sure I get this right. A team out of uh, publishing in Nature, out of the lab uh, of Ranga Diaz, an assistant professor of physics and mechanical engineering, what they did was they wanted, they started combining their own materials together to see if they could get materials that would be superconducting in different conditions. And so we've done this already. This superconductor that you're seeing here is uh, a combination. A, a process of deposition of yttrium, barium, and copper oxide. And you can get it, and there's many other different types of superconductors that you can make in the lab. So they were trying to do this. They were trying to find something that could exhibit the superconducting at room temperature. What they did was specifically, let me get this right. They created, a, I'm going to say this wrong, carbonate, carbonaceous, that's not hard. Carbonaceous sulfur hydride. And this is basically a bunch of molecular solids smashed together. And what they did is put it in a diamond anvil or an anvil press. And what an anvil press can do is take a little bit of, they look like two giant rectangles, uh, two, sorry, rather, two giant pyramids. And inside of, uh, at the apex of the pyramids, you put a little bit of material and you press it, you press it together with extreme, extreme pressures to see how those materials perform at those extremely high pressures. And what they found was this sulfur hydride exhibited superconductivity at 58 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is the first time that superconducting material has been observed at room temperature. This is tremendous because then you could, as I, as I said before, you could start implementing the kinds of technologies that have that could revolutionize travel and medicine and all these things, all without the extra cost and danger and manufacturing process of cryogenic fluids. Having room temperature superconductors could literally change technology and society as we know it. When you have uh, components in a computer or, or other technology that no longer generate heat because there's no electrical resistance inside of their hardware. You could push the boundaries of processing to, to crazy boundaries. <laughs> that sounded redundant. But there's a catch. The catch is, is that this only exhibits the superconducting properties at 39 million pounds per square inch. Now, Unless you went to uh, engineering school, you might not know this off the top of your head, but uh, atmospheric pressure is 15 pounds per square inch. So this is 39 million. That is roughly the pressure at the center of the Earth. So right now, room temperature superconductors are still elusive. We, we, we are on the precipice of discovering a material that doesn't have to be at this pressure and still be at room temperature, can revolutionize all those things, like I said. But right now, implementing superconductors under that pressure would be much harder than just cooling them. So we're not there yet. But when you do get there, 
you can get some absolutely incredible properties. And this is footage. This is in real time. Magnet almost locked in place, more specifically flux locked, flux pin in space, above a superconductor, perfectly inducing a current in the superconductor, which creates perfect eddy currents, lossless, which act to repel the magnet, keeping it floating like this in space. Now, you might say, wow, what a handsome finger that was. And look how well shot and well lit this superconductor is. Well, that's because in the very near future at the facility, we'll be doing a very long explana uh, explanation, and explanation and explainer on exactly what quantum levitation is and how it works because that's mine. I got my hands on a superconductor and 3,000 magnets and you're going to see a lot of amazing footage just like this, hopefully very soon. You know, I want to see what the, what the chat has to say about that, because it, it's inarguably gorgeous. Just like my hair. Yeah, people being blown away by how much PSI or KPA that is. It's, it's, um, it's millions of atmospheres. Like 2 million atmospheres, something like that? That is not viable. Oh, what? Why is it? I spilled the invisibility. Yeah, Evan! Told you not to do that. Shameful Brainbot says it's just standing on electricity and then makes this face. Oh! Don't. Don't. Screen cap that. Holy crap, people were just waiting. Oh, look at all you simps. Oh, you were just waiting. I love it. Okay, let's do it. You challenge me? Cade Peterman with the five says, Hey, Kyle, love the show. Thank you. When are you coming back home? Mom misses you. We want our dad back. We'll talk about this. We're not going to talk about this now, okay? She did say something about me, though. How does she look? Anyway, Liger XT5 with the $5 donation says, Too bad you can't replace the magnet with a capacitor. A flux capacitor? <laughs> Keep up the great smart humor. <laughs> well, I don't know about great. Uh, we have Calvin McGowan with the Canadian hundred. A, a, a mapley hundred. Says, why is ice slippery? You seem like a fine man to explain it. That is a difficult question. Um, you need to define what slippery means. Um, it's kind of like asking why water is wet. It's like an intrinsic property of water that is wet in, in a similar fashion. Ice is slippery because that's what ice is. But there are, a, there are two ways I see around it. And one's kind of a cop-out because it's a definitional thing. Where, um, well how do you define slipperiness? Well, then slipperiness would need to exist on a spectrum of stickiness or, or immovability, high friction, and very uh, slipperiness, very low friction. We have what are called coefficients of friction for many different materials that enumerate just this spectrum that we're talking about. So, for example, the coefficient of friction of uh, rubber on asphalt, like your car, is like 0.5 or whatever. That means it would take about half of the weight of the car to make it start moving, to overcome static friction, make it kinetic friction. Um, ice, on the other hand, has a coefficient of friction of like 0 0.05 or whatever it is. It's much, much less. It's, you know, uh, what is that, 10 times less? Yes. Um, so if you define it, via the coefficients of friction. Ice is slippery because it has a very, very low coefficient of friction, and therefore when you're standing on it, it's, it only takes a fraction of your weight to begin you sliding. That's why you can push with push someone on the ice with less than their weight, and it's like that. Um, some, uh, some materials actually are have a coefficient of friction over one. 
Um, and the cool example of that is uh, F1 cars, if you like uh, F1 racing. Their tires are so sticky that um, they have coefficients of friction above one, which means it, it would take more than the weight of the car to make the car begin to slide, which is crazy if you think about it. Um, and then the other way to define slipperiness would be, you know, you could do a more physical kind of thing. And I think Smarter Every, Every Day did an episode on this, but like, say you're on ice skates on the ice. The ice skates act to create regions of extremely high pressure on their blade edge, which compresses the ice, which melts the ice because compression leads to inc increase in temperature, uh, all things being equal. And then uh, this compression, this heating effect, uh, produces water, which helps you glide on the ice. Um, I, I tend to prefer the frictional explanation. Elrin Stormwalker with a 20 says, show Kyle, love the hell Ugh. First time getting the show live, but I've been a patron for a while. I've been watching you since Because Science. You made my 10 hour work days go by so much quicker. Well, Elrin, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I wish I, could, I, I wish I could make 10 hour work days go by so quickly that it was like time dilation going on, bro. But I can't, but thank you for your 20. Once I figure out how to do that, I will use it for good, probably. Master of All with a uh, 12, Master of All, frequent supporter, and I think I missed their first donation. I recently got into bouldering and outdoor top rope climbing instead of just top rope in the gym. It's really interesting how different they all are. Have you ever done any outdoor climbing? Yeah, I've done outdoor climbing in Kentucky, one of the best places for it, um, but I'm kind of through and through a boulder. Um, so I've done uh, lead climbing outside, like 512A, 512B, um, and I've done outdoor bouldering. I think the the hardest thing I sent out there was like a V9, um, but that was like one of the first things that I tried. Um, outdoor bouldering is extremely different, uh, but I, I like, I prefer indoor because you can climb so much more, so much more quickly, so much more conveniently, and you can train yourself on these weird moves that you will never ever see outside. Um, and about the best I got before lockdown, because I, uh, I have a hangboard now in the facility, but I haven't actually climbed in like six months. Um, I was flashing like V10, so I was... I was up there, but uh, I've also gained a lot of weight because I've just been squ squatting. <laughs> I'm thick with two cc's for cubic centimeters. Alino Villegas with the 10 says, Kyle the show love, hey. <laughs> Are you familiar with Alex French guy cooking on YouTube? His show and style reminds me of a lot of modern Alton Brown. No, I'm not familiar, but I'll have to check that out because you know I love me some Alton. Casey Miller with the 20 says, hey Kyle, really enjoyed the show, thank you. What is your favorite model of the universe? Is it super string theory or, su or, or something else? I, I don't know enough about string theory to have any real opinions about it. I know it's still kind of fringy. I know a lot of people study it, but um, but of course, I, I it, it's not like the the uh, go-to model for model cosmologists. So uh, I don't really have a favorite model because I'm not confident enough to speak at length about any of them and tell you why. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I don't. I can't have an informed opinion, so I won't. <laughs> Imagine more people said that. Uh, let's pause the Super Chats for a second so we can get on to our next topic. I'll try to get to everyone I possibly can, though. Spasmodius with a 10 says, Hey, O'Kyle, love the love show. Yeah, I, yeah, I saw it. Don't try to brain bust me. First time catching you. My question is, instead of looking for an Earth-like planet, shouldn't we be looking for an entire solar system that matches our simp for science? Um... That kind of seems like the same thing to me, where you'd be looking for a star in the similar size range and then using something like the transit method to look for an adequately sized planet. Um, as I pointed out in the Goku episode, having a planet with the right gravity is critical. Um, but I don't know, that's, a, that's an astronomer question. Is it easier to detect stars that indicate Earth-like planets or is it easy to detect exoplanets that are like Earth? I, I'm gonna guess since we've cataloged so many stars and not that many exoplanets, that's much easier to find the solar systems. Um, but that's difficult to say. I, I think it'd probably be much, much harder to tell whether or not a solar system could harbor life as we know it versus looking at an exoplanet and then evaluating it that way. So I don't know what is easier. That, that would come down specifically to um, what astronomers can do and what's easiest. Um, Howard Luther Gilson IV, jeez. <laughs> 
Love you, Kyle. Just simping. Do you follow F1? No, I do follow Superbike a little bit because my dad is uh, big into Superbike racing and he has a Ducati and I rode on it once and the acceleration on those is scary. Uh, Prada Mesh with the 314.16 somethings says, Hey, Lyle, shove the cow. Don't start doing that. Don't st st stop it. If you start misspelling it, I'm going to lose my mind. Great to catch the live stream finally. What would be like what would it, what would it be like to be in a universe with two dimensions of time? Now again, let's just um let's pause the super chats for a second so we can uh, get to our next topic. I don't want to leave anything out. Two dimensions of time. I, I don't know, dude. <laughs> we, uh, we can't even grasp what the fourth dimension intuitively intuitively would look like and feel like. So to have two dimensions of time What does that even mean? I honestly don't know. You stumped me. How dare you? Vladimir with a 10 says, Hey, Kyle, show the love. Okay. Huh. So because of communica communicators like you and a great teacher, I ended up becoming a high school physics teacher from a passion lit by you human stay safe human simp for science. Yes. It's all about passing it, passing it on to the next generation. Look, I'm too old to figure all this stuff out. All right. My time has passed, so the best I can do is try to excite people, get young people excited. Maybe they can figure it out before I boil alive in my skin. Elizabeth Calvert, always in the chat, always supportive with the 50. He says, as a reminder to everyone, please wear a mask. My dad, who is at super high risk, just found out someone at work tested positive. Yes, keep Elizabeth's dad safe. Do you not want that, you monster? And lastly, before our next topic, uh, Cairo, Cairo Fox, cool name, with the five, it says HKLTS. HKLTS. All right. That's better. I do like that. Hashtag HKLTS. Just wondering if we have any stem cell therapies that can throw parts of the, that can throw parts of the optic nerve. Do you mean grow? Curious all if I'll eventually get my sight back. Well, oh, geez. I, I don't know if that means that uh, you're currently blind, or you're losing your sight. Um, but I do, I do think there are current stem cell therapies for restoring sight. I don't know what they are specifically. I do remember hearing about them. So I would, um, think about, um, asking around about them or, um, if, 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 uh, if accessibility is an issue, asking someone, you know, or someone you're close to, to, to help research them. But I do think there is something there. So with that. Let's go on to our second topic, which I, oh, I know what it is. It's fun and it's a quick one. You'll get it. So, one tenth of a second is about how long it takes a human to blink their eye. And if you want to look weird, don't blink at the same time, blink uh, in succession or like, you just look weird. A millisecond is about the time it takes for a neuron in a human brain to fire and then return to rest. One picosecond, which is one trillionth of a second, is the time it takes to execute one machine cycle by an IBM silicon transistor. One attosecond, one quintillionth of a second, this is the best timing control that we have for lasers, high power lasers um, in their current iteration. It's also the perception time for the flash, apparently. But how much smaller of a time can we get? Well, enter the zeptosecond. Yeah, that's 10 to the negative 21 seconds, which is a zeptosecond is a trillionth of a billionth of a second. Now, why am I bringing this up? Well, as physicists are wont to do, they are trying to increase the resolution of machinery and mathematics in measuring small quantities. And one of those measurements is time. So there, there are a number of 
research labs across the planet who are trying to record the smallest time. This was broken recently in a published report. And what they were looking at is kind of what you see in the representation behind me. Well, there's an arrow behind, there's a little thing. So photoionization is when a photon hits something and an electron pops out, <laughs> more or less. And this process happens unbelievably quickly. And what these researchers wanted to do is see if they could resolve that time using a very complicated technique, could they resolve that time, as I said. So the researchers at Goethe University, they measured how long it takes for a photon to cross a hydrogen molecule. Now, based on the average bond length of the molecule, they recorded 247 zeptoseconds. Which, yes, does sound like something in Futurama, but lo, it be real. This is the shortest time span that has ever been measured by anything, any human, anywhere. And as I speak, you know that there's other units of time, like a jiffy is like an actual unit of time? Like it, there's a physics unit of time? Anyway, as I said, this is going to be a short one because I just wanted to bring to your attention the zeptosecond and just how good we are getting at measuring small units of time. No, that's it. No, I don't, I don't even have more. I could. I don't. I could. <laughs> what a fantastic transition. What a, what, a, what a thrilling piece of science that was. Probably just shouldn't have included it. How long is a Jiffy? Well, I could look that up, but I'm afraid if I touch too many buttons at my control command console here that something about the image is going to change. So you can look it up. I got a lot of hotkeys over here. Jesus Skywalker with the Australian $20. He says, hey, Kyle, have you heard about the major power distributor in New Zealand starting to trial long range wireless wireless power transmission for commercial use. I think that started off strong in the accent and then really finished poorly. I have not. Uh, so you can do long range power transmission that's wireless if you have, um, woohoo, look at all these people. Oh, I'm gonna have to re uh, okay. uh, If you have something like microwaves and a receiver, I have not heard of New Zealand doing it, uh, but what I will say is that New Zealand seems like they are on, they are on the level. Their, their prime minister is lovely. She loves science. She likes science communicators. Seem, uh, you see that video that I tweeted of uh, one of the New Zealand officials being like, sit down, sunshine, not here. Uh, to a guy who was like, how can you prove coronavirus is real? So I like New Zealand right now. If they were letting me in, I'd go. I do look more Australian than New Zealand, though. Uh, we have Solid Snake with the 20. It says, why isn't there an identical planet to Earth in perfect orbit opposite of Earth? Never visible. We would have s we would have seen signs by now from gravity effects on other celestial bodies. Any other signs? Thanks, Kyle. Why isn't there an identical planet to Earth in perfect orbit opposite and never visible? I hate to break it to you. Big boss or whatever clone you are now who cares i don't don't get me started on death stranding L really i it's so bad anyway um there isn't an identical planet to earth on the opposite side of earth's orbit because that's not how the solar system formed happenstance of uh planetary accretion but thanks for your 20 and i think we can all agree that my solid snake impression not bad Suck on that, David Hater. If I don't like David Hater, does that make me a David Hater hater? <laughs> Storm Warrior 007 with the 10, it says, Hey Kyle, is the reason we don't find other life in the universe because we look into the past when looking at other planets? Like if you look at uh, Earth from an X distance, you see dinosaurs? Well, not necessarily. Um, like aliens could look at us right 
now in their present and see dinosaurs, we could look at a exoplanet and see an alien civilization in its earlier history. Um, the problem being everything is so far, and this is, you know, goes into other theories like the Great Filter and the Fermi Paradox and all that stuff. But think about one of the problems is how long would a civilization have to be around to be close enough for us to see now? So the closest star is 4.3 light years away. So if it had a civilization currently on it, the time delay uh, between, you know, signal and receiving it is eight years. So the civilization, if it was around for longer than eight years, you could probably pick it up. But if something's on the other side of the galaxy, you know, and it's 100,000, 200,000 light years away, then if that civilization died out um, somewhere within the span that it would take the light to get there and back, we might not see it. We could miss it, right? If we weren't looking at that specific time when they died out. And is that crazy? No. I mean, humans, human civilization as we know it has only been a human species as we know it. Uh, Homo sapiens has only been around for a few hundred thousand years. And human civilizations only been around for about a tenth of that about 10,000 years. So on the cosmic scale of things, aliens could be looking at us, looking for human life right now and totally miss us because in the next 10 years, we nuke ourselves. <laughs> it's so much more likely than you think it is. It's already rendered with the 20 says, hey, Kyle, love the show. What do you know about boson stars? Hashtag simp for science. Nothing. <laughs> and let's pause the super chats for just a second so we can move on to our next topic. Elrin, again, with the 10, says, Simp for Science, if you can invent any one of the sci-fi technologies, which technology would you invent? I think a replicator would probably be hard to beat. Um, and Star Trek's obviously on the ground floor, but uh, a teleporter would um, completely revolutionize, obviously, travel, but, uh, you know, global commerce. and But, but a replicator, I think, to create anything from just available mass um as it's um expounded upon in star trek you end world hunger you end poverty um no one is wanting for food uh and that would alleviate you can't even put a unit on it right it there's we you are likely in a privileged position relatively speaking, to a lot of the world. And if you could immediately, with one technology, wipe out so much human suffering, you know, you know, last year, five million children died before the age of five. If you could use a technology to alleviate, not, not do anything crazy, don't get a lightsaber, don't get a spaceship that goes light speed, alleviate so much human suffering in one fell swoop, it would uh, make the world a better place, I think. Well, I don't think. I know that. Uh. <laughs> uh, again, let's pause the Super Chats as we get on to the next topic here. Ninja Blaze Zero says, Rate my sci-fi. Robobert is an average robot. After a routine checkup, he gets some bad news. His nanomachine microfauna has gone rogue. He's diagnosed with gray goo. Uh-oh. Now, again, I should say gray goo does not indicate its texture or appearance. It means that it's just kind of bland. But, um... <laughs> but if you're a robot and you're diagnosed with gray poo, you're gonna have bad poo. Oh, I... If you're... If, shut up. If you're a robot and you're diagnosed with gray goo, you're gonna have a bad poo. And you can quote me on that. Finally, Elizabeth Calvert again with a 10. Uh... Tiny, uh, my tiny human heard you ask that if you make you a David hater, if it makes you a David hater hater, and he just laughed and he said, of course not. That's silly. I like this silly science man. <laughs> oh, oh, tiny human, you have no idea how hard I'm trying to keep it together right now. Venus flytraps. Did you ever have one of these as a kid? I was obsessed with Venus flytraps as a kid. Um, I had one. And I remember uh, putting crickets in there and just watching it and wait until it, it caught one. Uh, I think the so many plants are non-carnivorous that when we find a carnivorous plant, they're just fascinating. Because it, go against, it goes against our intuitions as to what a plant is and what a plant can be. So I had one. They're fascinating. They're also fascinating to botanists and other researchers of plant. And what they've been trying to do for a while is figure out why these plants close shut. 
And a couple of years ago, they discovered that through electrical signaling, concentrations of different stuff in cells, yada, 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 the Venus flytrap has a sort of memory. It can remember, remember, this, this doesn't even have like a central nervous system. It can, quote unquote, remember the last time it was activated. So if you don't know, inside of the, ow, inside of a Venus fly, <laughs> inside of a Venus flytrap, there are very sensitive hairs. There's a couple of them. And if they are activated quickly enough, the trap closes shut. And so the plant has a sort of mechanism where it can remember the last time it did that. Now, what am I getting at? Where are you going with this? Well, there's a new study that was looking at what is the actual mechanism that triggers this carnivorous response. And the research discovered it be calcium. So calcium does a lot in cells, um, does a lot in your body. Um, calcium, calcium is one of those ions that transmits tremendous information throughout the body, it tells certain cells to do this, do that, send this electrical signal or not, and that's just with the concentration, relative concentration of c calcium inside of a cell and outside of a cell. If you took Bio 101, you know what I'm getting at. So the researchers were trying to figure out what in the cells of the plant were doing this. So they settled on calcium, and what they did is really cool. They created a transgenic Venus flytrap. That is to say, a genetically modified Venus flytrap. And what they did was used genes from different animals and plants. This is a common technique in uh, genetic engineering. And they made the cells of the Venus flytrap mouth fluoresce, give off light when exposed to calcium. So then in theory, if you try to activate the plant and calcium has something to do with it, then you will see this fluorescence. And so in this figure, you can see here that when they touch the mouth, it, there's a rapid spreading of this fluorescence, and this is calcium being activated all over the fly trap mouth, and then it closes down. You want to see it happen in real time? It's very cool. So there you can see a uh, scientist poking the plants, sensitive hairs on the inside there, and... See now, uh, so let's go through it one more time. So no calcium fl fluorescence, single trigger, a lot of it all over the plant. Second stimulus, even more movement occurs, and you can see it getting darker and darker, indicating that the calcium concentrations is going down. So what's important to note here, and this is about, this regards the function of the plant. If the plant always reacted to the first stimulus, that would waste a lot of energy because a lot of things might be hitting it. But if something like a fly was walking around in there, then there might be a second stimulus. So by having a second stimulus trigger the response, it uh, increases the percentage that the Venus flytrap will actually be consuming something. And so there is literally a concentration threshold where if you touch the plant once and then within 30 seconds, this is the memory bit, within 30 seconds, you hit it again, this pushes the calcium concentration over the edge and it triggers the response of the plant. And look how quickly this happens. It, it just, whew, it pull, and that's, and you can see, we're, we're hardly slowed down at all in, in the top left there, you know, one, two, three. It's, this is basically real time. So you can see how quickly that happens. So right here, you are looking at the memory, the, the concentration-driven memory of a transgenic Venus flytrap. I think that's so dang cool. I think that's so cool. And um, since we're running out of time before I get a flood of Simpins, which of course I do appreciate, let's move on to our peer review first, and then we'll uh, get back to you as soon as possible. But first... Peer review. So as I usually do uh, each week, kind of reminiscent of another show that I forgot the name of that I used to do, 
Uh, I like to look through all of the comments of the most recent episode at the facility, go through something that piqued my interest or was a correction that many people had or something was interesting and I shared something. And I like to highlight it here in peer review and then I make that person an honorary member of the facility and then I definitely get them a plaque. It's gold. Their name's etched in there, laser etching. Because you know I got lasers. And this week, I'm giving it to Bjarni Valur. Lord of the Southern Realm, who had a comment on my Goku weighted clothing episode, which I have been waiting to do for like literally four years, and is doing well, so thank you. I was very worried I was going to walk into the ocean, but I didn't. Many of you, and uh, Bjarni, including, say, well, Kyle, you dumb dumb. Why didn't you progressively increase the weight? Why didn't over time you go from, say, you know, 1.1G to 1.2 to 1.3 to 1.4 to 1.5? Because it seems like you had so much trouble with 1.5 putting it on right away. A lot of you had that, that comment. My response. First, Goku doesn't do that. Well, he might do that, but that is not... Uh, acknowledged canonically. So I wanted to make clothing that was as close as possible and use it in a way that's as close to, as possible to what we see in the anime. And what we see in the anime is that suddenly Goku is like, oh yeah, my shirt weighs 100 pounds, you know, 300 pounds. Like, oh! There was never a line where it's like, you know, I progressively increased my weight training. He does increase his weight later on when he has like 10 tons on his arms or something. But he doesn't go through this process, so I didn't go through that process. And second of all, if you increase the weight uh, uh, progressively over time, you start to get this regression that leads you to a familiar place. And by that I mean, okay, well, let's be safe and let's actually strength train the way that we think strength training works and not the way that Goku does it. I've done two videos on that now. So if we want to do strength training, what do we do? Well, we have a uh, weight that is challenging and we don't work out with it 24 seven. We only work out with it in short periods of time. And we do exercises with it that are actually beneficial for the muscles and not just on your wrists and stuff like that. Okay, well, a little bit of weight for a short amount of time that doesn't put extended strain on small muscles. If we increase that to 1.2G or effectively 1.2G, what we're doing, well, now we're only increasing the weight and we're still not using it all the time and in a way that Goku does. No matter how much we increase the relative Gs there, if you're doing it the way that you're telling me to do it, we're just strength training. You're just squatting more and more each week. What Goku does is putting a relative increase in weight all at once to simulate a specific gravity and then train under that. He does this in the gravity chamber as well. Even, and, and hey, anime nerds, I'll also point this out. When Goku goes to like 20G or 50G or whatever in that spaceship, you see that he's working so hard he can barely get off the ground, he can barely walk around, he almost dies in the ship. And that was my experience. So progressively increasing the weight safely in a strength training manner is just normal working out. That's not what we wanted to do. We wanted to try anime clothing. So that's my response. You can take it or leave it, but I think I did it correctly. And that won't be the last you see of the weighted clothing. Oh, I have some interesting plans for it around December-ish. No, I'm not gonna cosplay as Santa. Santa doesn't exist. You know who knows that? Bjarni knows that. And for bringing that up, and for making so many kids sad, Bjarni, you are an honorary member of the facility. <laughs> oh, I'm losing my mind, Kevin, if you don't have that plaque. What? Oh, are they here? Oh, they want to do a little bit of press? Oh, yeah, okay, just... One second. I'm, I'm sure the plaque will get here. Just a second. I'm going to take a short. It was just a short commercial break.
Hey there, it's your boy. Do you want to see your boy possibly win an award for Science Influencer of the Year? I'm one of the finalists among many other very uh, worthy finalists, including some names you may have heard before. If you like my channel, you probably like Isaac Arthur's channel. I worked with Tamara Robertson on Mythbusters The Search. But if you want to see me potentially take home the first annual Outpost Con Asteroid Award for Science Boy of the Year, you can go to outpostcon.com. You can register. And on Saturday, October 24th at 7 PST, you'll see the award ceremony. And you get to find out who wins. There's also a number of panels talking about science, sci-fi, skepticism, science communication, all throughout that day, your boy is on one panel talking about uh, science and YouTube. It's all digital. Um, so you can go to outpostcon.com if you want to see me potentially take home the gold or whatever the equivalent is. I'm not saying that if I don't win it, you'll never see me again. But I'm also not, not saying that. This is nice music. I'm not not saying. So going back to the chat uh, for a little, for a couple minutes, because I still got one more thing that has to do with water bears, and I love water bears. Uh, Otzit says, choosing between Isaac and Kyle is really hard. Yeah, Isaac makes, has been consistently making fantastic content for years, so it is, it is hard. Caden Olar says, hashtag Kyle 2020. No, but I could probably do a better job in like the public health area for a certain administration at the moment probably which is sad elizabeth oh alicia uh alicia or alicia i uh i apologize if it's not correct her bitter says no question just a thank you for your work in stem my grandpa oh with a 50 ah my grandpa was a computer engineer and mathematician and instilled in me the importance of learning he passed away last year and your show reminds me of the passion that he had the world needs more people like you alicia or alicia Thank you so much for sharing that with me. Um, that's incredibly touching. Um, and I can't say this for sure, but knowing the demographics of this show and this channel, I'm going to guess um, that your grandpa would be very proud of you and what you're doing and what you seek to do. So if I could be a part of your life in any small way to, to further what he represented to you, then um, some of the best praise I can get. So thank you so much. Uh, I, that's nervous laughter. I, I'm not laughing. I just, it's hard for me to take compliments. You know? Thank you. <clears throat> D Hammer with the 20, so you gotta turn it off and then you gotta turn it back on again. D Hammer with the 25 says, if a teleporter was created using quantum entanglement and the previously teleported were proven to have no side effects, would you use it? I'm fine with teleport I'm I'm fine with Star Trek style teleportation in that if the previous me died and then an identical me was reconstituted somewhere else physically speaking if I'm identical perfectly identical there should be no loss and if there's no loss I have no philosophical qualms about quantum reincarnation I, 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 I believe from the evidence that I gather from the universe that we are in an in, in unimaginably complex conglomeration of atoms moving electrons around. And that's it. That's fine. It's beautiful and gorgeous. And so it, it speaks to the, 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 the inherent crazy complexity of the universe. So if you took all my atoms apart and you're like yep they all go there and then you put them all back together and you're like oh they all go there i'm fine with it i wonder if it would tickle probably not might be excruciating uh ed bangor with the 20 says hey kyle love the show let's pause uh the donations for just a second so we can get to our last topic i want to tell you about water bears hey kyle love the show thank you you weren't correct oh okay you weren't correct how much weight troops carry. So I said that I was carrying more weight with, as Goku than uh, many military personnel do on a regular basis. The average Marine is 180 pounds and can go into combat carrying up to 200 pounds. 
see Captain Thompson's thesis um, at Naval Postgraduate School. Well, I do have a relative who teaches at West Point, so I'm like for like 20 years, so I'm familiar. But if the average Marine is 180 and they can carry, they can go into combat with 200, then they are laboring under 2G. Um, or more, uh, slightly more than 2G. Uh, that, it strikes me as something is off. Um, based on my experience, based on what I've read about troops who wear even, you know, 30% of their body weight for extended periods of time, carrying two Gs all of the time would be incredibly damaging and would would reduce combat effectiveness like crazy. I don't doubt that a Marine could carry 200 pounds. I, I, I'm sure, I am absolutely positive they can. Especially like a fireman's carry of someone else. Um, but behind that figure, I'm, I'm just, I'm suspecting it's, yes, I could carry 200 pounds of gear into into combat, but would I be, would I be carrying it the whole time? Would I just be carrying... Um, you know, gear to an outpost, putting it down, and then, you know, search and destroy, or, or um, you know, you're not house clearing with 200 pounds, you know what I mean? Uh, so I could be totally wrong, but I, I feel like there's something hiding behind those statistics that you wouldn't be doing, you know, a five mile grunt run under 2G. I think that would break a lot of people. Would it break a Marine? Probably not, but I, I just... I think there's probably something else there. So let's get to our, and I could be wrong. Look at me. I'm also 180 pounds too. So I, I, I get, it'd be, it'd be so hard. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I got thick during lockdown. So let's go into our last topic before we get into anything. We're already a little bit late. That's fine because you know why? Tardigrades. Little water boys. So uh, water bears have captured the public's fascination with the small um, for two reasons. One, they look like little bears, little uh, hexapetal bears. They got little faces and little mouths, and they're cute. But the second reason why is that they are arguably the most robust life form on Earth. Um, they can extend, they can... Uh, withstand incredible temperatures, incredible pressures. They can go without water for like 30 years um, into a hibernate, uh, hibernation state. They can withstand the vacuum of space um, and incredible uh, radiation, like X-ray radiation. They are the hardiest of the hardigrades. <sighs> we should call them hardigrade, hardy grades. Write that down. Anyway, uh, Hullaba News and hardy grades. It's a good stream. So why am I bringing this up? Well, researchers in India were out on the prowl looking in extreme conditions to see if they could find more extreme uh, organisms. And what they found was a water bear, a tardigrade, unlike the other tardigrades. How they sorted this out was they found a, a bunch of moss piglets, which they're also known as, because they live in moss. Found a bunch of them. And they want to see, eh, let's see what happens if we just uh, bombard them with a bunch of UV light. I'm sure the Indian researchers did not sound like that. But they put them under like a kilojoule lamp of ultraviolet. And, and when you have that much ultraviolet radiation, which is ionizing, the same kind of stuff that comes from the sun, it can kill most stuff. It's a germicide. It just, it just, uh, it just vapor, it doesn't vaporize. It just... Um, ionizes life so much that the life just dies. You just mess with so much internal machinery that the life cannot continue on. However, when they did this, they found that a certain kind of water bear, a certain reddish-brown water bear, in the group did not die at all. In fact, if you look down here, uh, the white dotted line is one of the species and the black dotted line is this new species that they found. The y-axis is the number of live specimens, and on the x-axis is days. Good, good. X-axis is days. So underneath this ultraviolet radiation. So they, they thought to themselves, why? How could one tardigrade, in addition to the, all this other hardigrade stuff, now it's completely resistant? 
And so they went in deeper, closelier, and they looked at these new tardigrade species underneath a powerful microscope. And then they shone the ultraviolet on them again. And surprisingly, whoop, they turned blue. Like the calcium in the Venus flytrap, these new reddish, brownish hardy boys started fluorescing blue. So the hypothesis here is, what's actually happening is that this new species of hardigrade evolved a sort of chemical shield to ultraviolet radiation. A chemical, which wasn't identified unless I missed that, but I don't think it was identified. A chemical that transforms harmful ultraviolet light into harmless blue light. So that's like a, that's like a cool sci-fi shield, right? Like someone's blasting you with an energy ray, it's UV, you know, and burn your eyes out or whatever, but then it's just like, and you glow blue. It's like, ha <laughs> transform your laser beam into blue light, you dumb dumb. That's how I imagine a tardigrade would sound, but that's, that's pretty cool. But it gets cooler because is this aspect of the tardigrade's biology super mm, interwoven into its body or is it something that could be transmitted, this chemical shield? Well, what the researchers did is then they, uh, they, 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 they ground a bunch of them up and they extracted the essence. Some tardigrades were harmed in this experiment. But they extracted their essence, and you can see their essence there on the... Yes, right there. So uh, this, this essence was also glowing. And what they did was they painted, effectively, the other tardigrade, they smeared, they smooshed them, they, they, they put this, this essence on the other tardigrades that did not fluoresce. You can see here the ones that are not fluorescing, and they just died. And when they painted the old species with this essence of the new, like 60% fewer of them died. Something like that. It was a huge increase in survivability. So researchers have discovered a new tardigrade that, among with all the other things it can do, it has a chemical ultraviolet shield that could be harvested and applied. Could it make a sun? Kevin, ask if they would make a sunscreen out of it and uh, patent it for me. What would they do with it? <laughs> I have no idea. I don't have any money writing on it. Let's go to the chat for just a little bit more of this show. <laughs> I'm not tired. You're tired. I think everybody's tired. Uh, Geek Joke says, like Tier Zoos said, tardigrades are overrated. No, they're not. <laughs> they're, they're literally hardier than anything. Yeah, yeah, Tier Zoo. Uh, <laughs> did elephants hack biology? Tier S unbel... No. Hey, man, if I could, if I could use unlimited B-roll from the BBC without getting uh, called by lawyers, I would do. I don't know why I'm taking shots. I have no reason. Uh, Boise, free runner, with the five, says physical standards for Marines is to be able to carry 150 pounds for nine miles, according to the Marine Corps Times. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> 150 pounds for nine miles, that is a hell of a carry. I did about a kilometer in Goku's clothes, which is only 0.6 of a mile. Um, so they're carrying more for much longer. Hey. They're Marines. Um, I buy that. I to Of course, I totally buy that. I, I believe them. But would you be carrying that literally all day for everything that you do and have it distributed not, not good for heavy weight? So the difference, bet the difference here is um, putting 150 pounds on your back in your pack in a way that you can kind of muscle up and carry... That makes more sense to me. But distributing it so that, you know, roughly half of, it, half of it is on your chest and the rest is on your wrists and your ankles, much harder. Much, much harder. Try lifting up your, your service weapon accurately and effectively and quickly 
when your arm when your wrists each weigh 20 pounds that that would probably uh, hamper combat effectiveness to such a point that you it would be dangerous to do it so i guess that's my point andrew with the five says we need a host we need to host a battle royale where the winner is ground into paste and we can smear them on ourselves to absorb their essence <laughs> I think that's coming in the last in the next um, Among Us update. Voicek with the five says, "Imagine glowing blue on a beach." Yeah, I do have fantasies of going down to San Diego into the uh, plankton, the bioluminescent plankton, and just becoming like a Navi. Is that an old reference? Who cares about Avatar anymore? Master of All always coming in at the end of the show with the five says, "Do you know why physics doesn't make sense at a sh at a time shorter than the Planck scale?" Sim for science facilities taking applications. It's true. Facilities currently taking applications. I don't know. I don't know the physical reason why Planck time is the shortest possible time. I think it's quantum mechanical based and quantized, but I don't know. I honestly don't know. That's a question for my adoptive father, Derek of Veritasium. And as always, Music Central Piano 29 with the 50 coming in clutch as he, she, they always do. Keep up the great work. Cool shirt. You've got my science communicator of the year vote. Continue to inspire. It's great learning how many people you've inspired to pursue STEAM degrees and occupations. Hey. I'm just doing my best. Uh, sometimes my best gets me tired. But thank you, uh, Music Piano. Always, Robert Rush with the five. Sorry, Carl. I'm just imagining how thick you really are right now. That's not your fault. That's not my fault. That's your fault. Well... I've been doing a lot of squat. Anyway, so <laughs> what did we go through today? We went through a number of topics. We talked about how uh, we found a room temperature superconductor with a catch. You need a, 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 an Earth's core amount of pressure to make it work. If you want to know much, much more about how quantum levitation works exactly, stay tuned at the facility. We'll be going through it all because uh, that's my footage right there. And it's I think it's beautiful. Uh, we also talked about the Zepto second, the smallest possible time that has, not the smallest, but the smallest time that has ever been recorded. It was short, sweet, and I probably shouldn't have talked about it. It wasn't that interesting to me. We also talked about Venus flytraps, how they have a chemical memory, and we learned about this through genetic engineering. Calcium also took one of your comments and questions. A lot of people correcting me on how much Marines can carry, but I, I think there's some wiggle room and some uh, confounding variables there. I think I did it pretty close to how Goku does it. If you haven't watched that video, please go back to the channel and do so. And finally, we talked about hardy tardigrades who, they can survive space. And if you try to blast them with an ultraviolet laser, they just say, ha ha, now I'm glowing. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Office Hours. If you want to continue this conversation, if you want to get behind the scenes episodes, if you want to talk with me on Discord, I mostly lurk, but I try to be there every day. I'm tired, but I'm there. Uh, we have Commander Leagues. We have all these other things. Uh, you can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill right now and join the facility today and get your name on Aria each week. It's fantastic. This week on the facility, um, it's not a big and boisterous one. It's not like Goku. It's not like quantum levitation. It's a uh, one of my staff members at the facility turned me on to an aspect of game theory. <laughs> game theory. That I... Uh, Got very fascinated with. So this week, it's not going to be a banger, but it is interesting. It's not flashy. But uh, I did enjoy film. It's a, it's a little bit different pace, and I did like that. So I hope you enjoy it, too. Oh, and I'm, I, I, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but... Am I planning a big old test-related thing for Cyberpunk? Maybe, Yes. I definitely am. So if you wanna if you wanna learn about cyberpunk science, if you wanna learn about quantum mechanics, quantum levitation, keep it tuned here to the facility. Have a wonderful rest of your week. If I do not talk to you in the facility, until then, please for the simp of science, be nice to each other, wear a mask, because this is all we got. And I want you coughing on me. <laughs>